Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first lecture in our third unit. We're starting off with the Roman Republic. So the early days of the history of Rome, we've already looked at when we looked at the work of the Etruscans, the original kings of the uh, city-state of Rome, but we're now moving into the era of the development of the early phase of Roman uh, culture the Roman Republic, which will lead us to the Roman Empire. Just to get a sense, again, of what we're looking at initially centering around the city of Rome itself, under the uh, le earliest leaders of the Roman Republic, leading us all the way up to the uh, era of Julius Caesar, the Roman uh, territory is going to expand. That area will become basically the entirety of the peninsula that is Italy. And by the end of the imperial era at its height, everything shaded here within this kind of pale gold is going to fall under the control of the Roman emperor. So again, the Republic is founded 509 BCE. It eventually absorbed the culture of ancient Greece around the year 146. It ends really with the um, inheritor to the uh, power of Julius Caesar. Caesar's heir, Octavian, when he finally defeats Cleopatra and Mark Antony, essentially becomes the first true imperial ruler of ancient Rome. So we can then look at Rome entering into a period known as the Pax Romana, the era of essentially peace within the empire, although not peace for the people that were being conquered by the empire itself, um, broken up with a handful of disputes between uh, and succession, but we do uh, move into the high empirical period with emperors Trajan and Hadrian, at which point expand to its greatest extent. The later part of the empire does involve uh, the empire becoming so large that it becomes difficult to control for one emperor. And so around the year 285, we actually have the empire split under the rule of four major rulers, two Augusti and two Cesare. And that system really does not work. Constantine eventually is able to reconsolidate power over the entire empire. He also issues the Edict of Milan in 313, which makes it legal for the first time to openly practice Christianity in the empire. And as his family uh, converts to Christianity, we eventually have Christianity becoming essentially the state religion, and it then spreads um, more easily throughout the uh, Roman Empire. We definitely can see in the earliest phases of Roman architecture influence from the Etruscan style. This looks a lot like the Etruscan temple that we looked at in the previous unit, but we also start to see more and more elaboration of these forms of taking on some of the aspects of Greek architecture as well. The first piece to know for the purposes of the test is the Temple of Portunas. This is found in the city of Rome, and it is very different from a Greek temple in some respects. Instead of having a series of terraced bases, to create steps that would essentially allow you to enter from all four sides. You notice that this temple is raised up on a platform with a single staircase at the front. We also don't have columns running all the way around the outside with a cella or nails on the interior of that. We see here that actually the illusion of continuous colonnade of columns around the outside is achieved by the addition of these what we call engaged columns. They act are not structural, they form a decorative element on the outer wall of a much expanded cella. Clearly, the only people allowed inside would be the priests, so still worship tends to take place outside, but it doesn't have the kind of ambulatory effect walking around the outside that the ancient Greeks favored. You can see, too, that it does um, use the ionic order that's much more uh, common, more elegant, and we see it quite frequently in Roman design. Here, this uh, is the current restored state of the temple itself. And along the back side, decorative mosaic or uh, fresco work from the temple as well. 
definitely see the Romans taking on some different types of architectural forms than the Greeks are going to use. Some temples will actually begin to be rounded and with domes, such as this example from the early first century BCE. And this idea of round arches and domes is really what's going to start setting the uh, Roman architecture apart from the Greek. The advent of this technology of the rounded arch allows the architects to build taller uh, and also to distribute weight in a more efficient manner. So buildings could be even a little bit heavier, which allows us to build ever taller, more complex structures. So in the Greek tradition, we had an inner cella or nows of a temple surrounded by a colonnade. The new design that we're starting to here in Rome is what we sometimes refer to as pseudo-peripteral. Peripteral being columns all the way around the outside. Pseudo-peripteral is the fusion of those continuous columns created by the use of engaged columns along these much expanded walls. The concept of a barrel vault comes from the concept of extending an arch into a long uh, hallway. We saw corbelled arches earlier when we looked at the architecture of we now have that smooth, rounded barrel created by essentially stacking multiple arches one behind the other to create a long hallway. When two such hallways intersect, we have what we call a groin vault. And you can see that here where these two uh, hallways, barrel vaulted hallways at 90 degree angles intersect. We definitely will see the use of the arch if you imagine spinning it in a circular pattern, leaving behind this uh, surface, you have the idea of a hemispherical dome. The dome that we'll look at that is of course the most famous is the Pantheon. The Pantheon has an oculus, an opening in the top. The drum is the wall that supports that hemispherical dome. Some of the most impressive architecture comes really early in Roman history as well. This is a Roman Republican example of a multi-purpose architectural building. The cap of it now, it was once a palace uh, during the Baroque, it is now a, a museum. So imagine instead of this structure here, you would have uh, a colonnaded hemispherical space then have a temple right atop it. But essentially, this building was constructed into a, an existing hillside, constructed mainly through the use of concrete faced with a different variety of materials, some of which is open stonework. You can see here the remnants of the main ramp that would be your access point to the first terrace, then along the central staircase to another another central staircase to a wider uh, terrace, angled staircases to the center here, this entire hemispherical area acts as a staircase itself in the shape of a Greek theater, which would then have had a colonnade atop it and a temple there as well to the goddess Fortuna. This particular example not only functions as a religious building, a temple or shrine to the goddess Fortuna, but it actually acts as a very public space. It is a space in the theater the theater area for uh, performances. It's a space also that includes shops. So you would go here to venerate a goddess, but you would also go to this site to purchase items, to um, browse um, the wares that were being um, provided for sale. Here's a reconstruction view. You can see that the original staircases would have been covered, so you would have been protected from the elements as you come up these staircase ramps to the central area and then up to this level this is where you'd have the majority of your shops also some niches for sculpture there up to a larger open space with a colonnade around it again a staircase to this hemispherical area that operates essentially as the shape of a greek theater and then stat again in this hemicycle space that would allow you then to venerate the goddess in the temple structure at the
really remarkable multi-use space and again a transformation of the natural space of this hillside to serve purposes meaning people's um, social standing and ability to create a space that provides for public meetings that provides for public worship and a focus of public life so even in the roman republic we have a sense of using architecture to change the landscape and to direct people's lives there's a fair amount of decoration that we have recovered from the sanctuary of fortuna in uh, primogenia what you see here is uh, the nile mosaic which is also kind of terraced in its appearance in a similar way to the building itself, but shows, again, increased naturalism. And when it comes to depictions of animals that can be found along the Nile, like the hippopotami and our various crocodiles, as well as figures of human beings kind of doing battle and hunting scenes as well. We definitely see this combination of wide open spaces uh, half circular spaces in a lot of the architecture of the Republic. This is a theater complex reconstruction. Uh, it was directed by Pompey, who was one of the councils of Rome. Uh, he served as council alongside Caesar at one point. So the idea of a public space that is the focus of your public life provides for entertainment as well as religious uh, expression as well as having uh, buildings that are dedicated essentially as uh, how we would use a public city uh, center, like a court a city hall. These are all the types of structures that are common to what becomes known as the Roman Forum. There are multiple in the city of there are actually multiple fora, plural of forum, that uh, were created by or at the um, commission of various emperors of Rome from the time of Caesar into the empire itself. And they're built kind of beside one another and they keep becoming grander and grander. The one we're looking at right here, the form of Caesar is eventually built uh, beside it, the form of Nerva, Augustus, and eventually we get to the form of Trajan as well. So this becomes an increasingly uh, impressive architectural feat trying to provide public space for things like uh, courts, libraries, uh, as well as public gathering spaces, as well as religious spaces. And it provides kind of a focus again for public life. This is the remains of the Roman Forum, which was begun in the Republic era and built to its grandest height during the empire. So really what we have left uh, primarily are the ruins. So we have to look at reconstructions of these buildings, but this is what we imagine the Roman Forum at its height might have looked like. We know that the Romans continued the tradition of decorating their temples much in the way that the Greeks did, providing art, uh, sculptural elements in the pediments as opposed to primarily along the top peak of the roof line the way the Etruscans did. We also know that they used a lot of fairly high relief uh, sculptural effect in borders continuous friezes in temples as well. One of the most remarkable things though about the Roman Republic era is this transition from bodies of the Greeks, which you can kind of see here in the statue of a general, to the very specific details of the face. It's There's almost a disconnect with this one from the face to the torso. They almost look like they're from two different sculptures. So what begins to happen in the Roman Republic is somewhat similar to what we saw in Hellenistic Greek sculpture, that we're looking at depictions that increasingly show people the way they really look in the real world. But with the added advantage, or the added emphasis rather, that these facial recognitions, the need for the sculpture to really depict the individual characteristics of a specific person's uh, face is also tied to religious life in ancient Rome. We know that the Romans not worshiped a pantheon of gods as the Greeks did, but they had a system of ancestor worship. And it was expected, especially in the elite classes, 
that you would have busts of your ancestors in your home in an altar that you would venerate to the people who came before you in your family. And that's what you see here with this example of a figure from the Roman Republic carrying or holding portrait busts of his own ancestors. And you can see that the technique of the contrapposto, even the proportions of the body overall feel very much like what we saw with the canon of proportions in the classical era of Greece, but the faces are now very highly specialized and specific to look like the person as they looked in life. A lot of these verist sculptures, we use the term verism to emphasize how truthful these images are, how true to life they are, are often of old men and it was the older men who really were in control of Roman society. Uh, the Romans had a system at this point in the Republic of being led by not a single king but by a voting group of senators. So the idea of the senators being in a sense from the people and having a say in the government is a little bit of a new idea. Generally speaking, the only people who were even eligible to have this kind of um, role had to achieve a specific age. They really were among the older members of society, male only, of course. But we get a sense from looking at these sculptures that the artists are now able to not only um, carve in a really skillful manner, but they're able to portray human emotion and human expression and the effects of age as it applies to each specific individual human being. So you can see that this is very different from the sculpture that we've seen up to this point. It's vastly different from the almost abstracted, idealized forms we saw in Mesopotamia and Egypt. It is very different from the supremely idealized forms we saw in classical Greek. It is somewhat more reminiscent of what we saw in the Hellenistic, but it is truly its own unique Form. It's as if Rome has taken the lessons of the previous cultures and really added something of its own into the mix. This desire to venerate age, to celebrate the specifics of one individual human being's achievement. We know that some of the uh, people lower on the social class um, were still able to move within society. So although the Roman Republic and then the empire relied heavily on slavery, freed slaves could begin to uh, amass themselves and their children could then become citizens as well. So as you see the decorations for funeral monuments, further down the social scale you are the more um, or less specific, I should say, the less specified the individual features generic they seem to be. We definitely see the Romans taking ideas from other cultures and making them their own, and that's very much the case with what uh, structural form we call the amphitheater. Essentially, it's two Greek theaters, which are half circular forms with raked seating facing a flattened area of the stage. If you imagine two such theaters with the flat edges placed together, then you have the Roman amphitheater, sort of uh, precursor to our modern sports arenas. We definitely see the um, evolution of architecture for private homes in the Roman Empire. We definitely have buildings that uh, mimic, in some respects, the structure of uh, the temples, that they sort of function along a central axis. The idea that's very different and specific to Roman design, though, are these open areas here. The central reception room in a Roman home is known as the atrium, and that space is open to the sky, and there's usually, within the atrium, there's usually area that has a fountain and a pool of water. So as you enter the home, you enter uh, kind of along a symmetrical central aisle with rooms flanking on either side, the focus being this kind of open air public space. So even within a crowded city, you would have an enclosure that also somewhat was open to nature. So even within a much larger uh, 
heavily populated area like the city of Rome, you would have areas of your own personal um, private space. That peristyle garden then becomes that um, colonnaded open garden. Kind of remarkable to have that space in a city like Rome. We then definitely want to take uh, some time to take a look at Pompeii, and I've included an enormous number of examples of architecture and artwork that I don't have time to go over um, in a brief overview, but you can spend some time looking at it yourself in the PowerPoint online. Pompeii, of course, is uh, well preserved because of the horrific tragedy that actually happened during the uh, period of the empire. Just uh, in the year 79 AD or CE, uh, this Vesuvius erupts and buries both Pompeii and Herculaneum and completely uh, obscures those cities. They were unearthed many centuries later, and that allowed us to see what had been incredibly well preserved as an example of what life was like in ancient Rome. The buildings, though, many of them in Pompeii, of course, were, were begun during the Republic era. A lot of the artwork is from the Republic era, and then added to as that aged until its demise. So there are a number of well-known uh, homes, private homes, have artwork, uh, particularly uh, wall painting, floor mosaics, uh, and we know the layout of the city itself really clearly uh, because it was preserved by the volcanic ash. The most important for our purposes study-wise is to look at the artwork within the architecture in Pompeii. And so Pompeii does give us kind of a microcosm of some of the major styles of wall painting for ancient Rome. The styles have been broken down into four major categories. First style is really almost trompe l'oeil illusionistic decoration. It's meant to look like patterned marble, different colored marble inlaid into the wall, even though it's all complete, uh, completely created with plaster and paint. So that first style or masonry style is this example to the left. Second style is probably the most well known. Second style actually creates this type of illusion that the wall disappears and that that space continues either to more of the room that you're in or as in this case in this example an illusion of a courtyard and the architectural space behind it so this column here is actually painted it really creates the illusion though that it's in the room with you and you're looking out into a courtyard third style is more about simple decoration, simple monochrome panels that have architectural details, very thin and somewhat elaborate as well. And then the fourth style is kind of anything goes. It's a combination of everything that came before it. So it has a slight uh, suggestion of infinite space. You can see that here feels kind of like second style out of a window onto a balcony. It has framed paintings on the wall, which is a little bit new. It has large polychrome areas to third style and then patches of illu illusionistic uh, marble, which is very first style. So fourth style really combines all those things together. So when you see um, what's left of Pompeii, it's kind of remarkable how intact it still is. And then these reconstructions give you a sense of how grand all of it really would have been at its height. So remember, just like with the Greek examples, these were not stark white marble buildings. They would have been painted very elaborately. And especially with the floors, we would have had pretty elaborate uh, mosaic as well. The buildings very often, of course, were open to the air, as we see in the atrium in this space. This is known as the House of the Surgeon. And then these are some of the frescoes from that space. So we know a lot more about wall painting from Rome than we do from Greece, partially because these things were so well preserved at Pompeii and at Herculaneum as well. This even shows us a painter working as an artist. So it's kind of a remarkable piece. Again, the recreations give you a sense of that first style being really brought into the forefront. There are frescoes from the house that we just looked at. 
see the attention to the body, the attention to the anatomy, the complexity of the poses, a lot of use of foreshortening, three-quarter views. This is far advanced um, in terms of illusionistic believability from anything that we've seen previous to this. Here's a combination style room. Elaborate mosaics, you can even see the dog's collar and leash in this piece, kind of awesome. So you can see how incredibly sophisticated the Roman painters really were. We have figures from multiple points of view, not just fully facing forward or in a strange composite view of a torso facing forward and legs in profile. We have fully realized painting here that clearly is gonna be an influence on artists who are gonna come after this period. Mosaic from the House of the Fawn. And some frankly erotic images as well. The Romans were never shy about depicting acts of intimacy between partners, as well as religious symbols. So it's interesting to take a look at these examples and try to imagine from extrapolation what life in Rome might have been like. If you can see the attention to detail that happens and the interest in decoration and the interest in making money and in making things beautiful, you can imagine how grand Rome would be at its height. This is one of my personal favorites. It's a simple enough still life in one sense, but what a unique object in another sense. It's very rare in other cultures that you see a painting simply of objects. That feels like something that comes to us much later um, the, some of the best examples I can think of date from the Baroque era in Western Europe from really the 1600s. So here we are, it dates that by over a thousand years with an incredible amount of realism as well. Some of these images, I think, really speak to us about the way that people lived and about the relationships between those people. This is from the house of Julie Felix. It's a portrait of the husband and wife. Um, it is one of the most well-known images of domestic life. You see that the wife has a stylist there. She is able to take a uh, record of the household um, finances. She's part of running the show. She has a much more public life than a Greek woman of, uh, com of comparable health. We can definitely see the interest in making the individual faces really look specific to who these individuals were in life. And you can see really delicate rendering around, especially the details of the noses and lips that really make these figures feel fully realized as three-dimensional beings. Kind of remarkable accomplishments. There's accomplishments in terms of making believable perspective as well. This interest in luxury goods and showing the things that are in the home occurs again and again throughout Pompeii. And that brings us to the piece really to know the Villa of Mysteries. The paintings within the Villa of the Mysteries really center on this particular room, and it's appropriate for us to think about religious life in Rome as we look at this piece. There were, of course, the veneration of multiple gods, but as the Romans began to expand their territory, they absorbed religious ideas of other people as well. So quite frequently, we'll find that there are similar myths and stories about gods and goddesses in culture that are almost exactly identical to Greek uh, stories. Very easy way to kind of show that you are a benevolent group of people is to share religious ideology with them and to uh, some ways of thinking you could more easily control a group of people if you had some ideas in common. So to have a Roman uh, building that's dedicated probably to a cult that has to do with the god of 
of wine, Dionysus, is really uh, helping to kind of connect it to traditions coming from other areas within the classical world, specifically from Greece. Having a different name for the god, but having the god serve the same function is really part of this ability to control a wider territory in a more benevolent way. So Bacchus becomes Dionysus in the Roman tradition. And what seeing is part of what we sometimes refer to as religious mystery cults. We use the term mystery not because they were keeping it necessarily secret from one another, but because we in the contemporary world don't know the details of how these faiths operated. We know that there was a fair amount of uh, widespread uh, use of these cults throughout the uh, Roman world. One of the religious cults in the Roman world eventually will be Christianity. Um, it is one of the cults that was not uh, publicly uh, allowed to be practiced. Some of the cults were a little bit more suppressed than others, and Christianity certainly was in the category of the ones that were very heavily repressed or oppressed. But this particular cult, we don't know exactly what its function was, but we do believe that the main focus had to do with the god of wine. So the image proceeds really from this element across, and we see people preparing, likely, like entering, preparing, and then somehow performing for or with the god Dionysus and his human consort Ariadne. And these are characters who feature pretty heavily in classical art and even into the Renaissance and the Baroque era as well. So characters who will have a great importance later. There are winged figures, perhaps victory. There are semi-nude and fully nude female revelers dancing, some of whom seem to be kind of whipping themselves into a frenzy. And then the figures end with more uh, seated, controlled poses toward the end of the uh, sequence of images. There's a definite eroticism, though, to these images, and they are very much in the second style. It appears almost as if you are looking not at paintings on the wall, but at figures in a procession or a ceremony that is happening against the wall. They're in the space that you're in, but that space is a little uh, illusionistically increased by this illusion of the floor continuing into space behind the figures in the religious ceremony. There's the Dionysus figure. You also can look very quickly at some examples of the ways that people met their end in Pompeii. The um, eruption of the volcano was so unexpected. The Roman word for volcano, um, really the word that we use comes to us from their belief in the god Vulcan who uh, ran the forges and forged the um, thunderbolts for uh, Zeus slash Jupiter. When the eruption actually happened, um, it took about 18 full hours for the full effect of the uh, eruption to wipe out the city of Pompeii and the city of Herculaneum. The explosion of the mountain first sent a massive column of smoke and hot ash and stone into the air. And it was a few hours before that uh, stone began to fall and some of it heavy forcing people indoors where they eventually became trapped. And when the second and third massive uh, events of the uh, volcanic eruption happen and they send even more uh, ash and smoke rocketing across a massive amount of space at an incredible rate, something in the excess of 100 kilometers an hour. Some people who were caught in the first wave in Herculaneum literally died instantaneously and their bodies turned to charcoal. In Pompeii, the uh, death was more agonizing. It took a little bit longer for the um, second and third wave of the eruption to hit them. People began to choke, actually, 
poisonous gases in the air as well as the ash itself uh, and then when they were uh, completely covered by the second wave of the bodies many of them were somewhat preserved in position as that ash hardened to stone it left cavities that later archaeologists were able to so we can actually see the positions the bodies were in when people died so it's a remarkable um, preservation of history including animals that is horrific in terms of its scale especially when you consider how many people now live in the general vicinity that was affected by that eruption in 79 uh, AD or CE scholars believe and people who have studied uh, atmospheric effects and, and uh, geologic effects believe that that Vesuvius likely to uh, suffer an, uh, an eruption roughly every 2,000 years. So it may be only about 50 years away from the next such eruption. Herculaneum was the city that was um, in some ways as tragic as Pompeii, if not even a little more emotionally tragic in that people um, fled their homes earlier but were unable to get assistance to um, get off of the shore to get onto boats and to get away. And Many of them died on the shore in the second major wave of the explosion of that uh, volcanic eruption. Some of the art from Herculaneum that really does give you a sense of the mastery that these artists had in depicting the real world the way it really looked. There are a kind of remarkable level of detail in attention to the specifics of fruits and plants and even uh, animals as well, of course, as itself well preserved in this example of mosaic from Herculaneum. Probably the most famous wall painting, um, not from Pompeii or Herculaneum, but from Prima Porta, from the villa of Livia, who is eventually the wife of the first emperor of Rome, is this gardenscape from a subterranean room in the villa of Livia, the eventual wife of uh, the first emperor, Augustus Octavian. When you look at the way that this is depicted, it is very much in second style. It creates the sense that the space of the room continues, but instead of opening to a slightly deeper space of the room, this opens out into a completely believable landscape that totally has uh, mastered both one-point perspective and what we would call atmospheric perspective, the effect of the plants closer to us in much darker value and in greater detail than those further away. And the further back you go, not only do you see less detail, but the image even becomes more blurry, a little more obscured. This painting is absolutely filled with the suggestion of the motion of the leaves in the wind and of birds flying and perching all throughout this garden. It's hard to see in this uh, slide, but the closer that you get to it, the more that you see that there's actual attention to highlight and shadow on the leaves themselves. This is virtuoso masterpiece level of painting landscape and we really haven't seen a truly pure landscape without a historical significance or without a religious significance in any of the previous cultures that we've looked at. 